Matthew 5 and 6 on the screen. Ready? Let's read together. Ready, set, go. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Father, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for helping us. You know what I'm trying to do next is impossible because I'm, I'm sinful. And you know what they're trying to do next is impossible because they're sinful. So we need you. We need you to touch the preacher and the hearer so that we're hearing and saying and receiving the same thing and all those things come from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you look in your notes uh, this morning, you'll see that I put a question mark beside the subtitle, Hungering and Thirsting for Righteousness, question mark. And I did that, uh, maybe for me more than for you, I don't know, because I was very, 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 and am very, 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 very challenged by this text, um, personally speaking. And so maybe I put this question mark for me. Do I, the question I had for myself is, boy, do you really hunger and thirst after righteousness. I mean, we all know that righteousness is good. Say amen. amen. And we all know that we, we are imputed righteousness that belongs to Jesus. Say amen. amen. And we all know that he wants us to adore and long for righteousness. And I'm sitting here looking at this. I'm going, but, but the text gives us two images, hunger and thirst. Now, I know that righteousness is good, and I know that I should want righteousness really, really bad. But do I? Because the image that we're given qualifies the heart that the king is looking for in the kingdom. He didn't say casually observe righteousness. He didn't say there would be a blessing that, that comes upon those who can rightly define righteousness. He didn't say that those who, can, who, are, who will be blessed, who can distinguish the righteous from the unrighteous. He said there's a blessing of being filled that will come upon those who hunger and who thirst. Hunger and thirst after righteousness and so I put a question mark there as I was kind of starting to get going on preparing this because I'm asking myself, and maybe that'd be a good drill for you, do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? And if not, what are you hungering and thirsting for? People hunger and thirst. I put some of this in your notes, I believe. Hunger and thirst for all kind of stuff. Wealth, you know, money, possessions, power, prestige. And oh, by the way, these first few, no one thinks they do this. So uh, fulfillment of physical lusts, status, gifts, leadership, Good feelings and, and self-fulfillment just really won't, you know, might put in parentheses there, you know, encouragement, you know, I'm thirsting for somebody to say something good to me. You know, like I said, some of these things are good. Some of these things are not so good. Family and friends obviously be a good one, right? Hungering and thirsting for better family relationships or more time with your friends. Nothing wrong, in, you know, intuitively with that. Nothing intrinsically wrong with that. Health and well-being in and of itself, as long as it's become an idol, some of these things are not bad. Uh, fellowship and fun. I mean, hey, you know, who, who doesn't want to break it down every once in a while, have a little fun? Purpose and meaning seems to be a big one even in the church. You would think the people that are saved wouldn't always be wondering what their purpose is, but, but that seem, it seems to be eluding us for some reason, and I, I'm amazed, still amazed at that, but anyway. And so, so the question I had in my own mind was, what am I hungry and thirsty for? Now, I, I, we need to kind of talk about this whole issue of hunger and thirsting, and we will as we go on. But let me just say here at the outset that the king, Jesus, is saying that there will be a blessing 
that comes upon those who really, 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 really want righteousness. That's another way of saying this. There's nothing casual about being really hungry and being really thirsty, as we'll talk about. There's a quote that I read that I thought was interesting. It says, the nat- hey, this is brother who lived a, uh, quite a while ago. Uh, Jay Harris wrote, the natural man may hunger for that which brings him gain, such as wealth and ease and honor. And then he gives this analogy that I thought was stunning. He says, the raven held a banquet amid the putrefications of death. Raven-like, unregenerated man seeks to allay his appetites by feeding on the perishable and the corrupt. But the Christian's hunger and his deepest and intensest want is righteousness. It's like when we were dead, we thought going to the club would fix it, and we didn't even realize we were feeding on that which is also dead. That's what he's saying here. It's like when we were, before we were regenerated, before we were Christians, we thought if we would just get enough money, we would, or or if somebody would build us up enough, or if we got the status that we wanted, man, that desire in us would just, you know, we, it'd be finally be quenched. And we didn't realize that we were dead men and dead women seeking after that, which was going to die anyway. And so we were raven-like in the sense that, you know, a raven's a bird of, of a carrion bird. And so it likes to feed on stuff. It ain't trying to work too hard. It's waiting until stuff is dead. Those, these are the birds that'll fly on the highway while you're driving and almost get hit because they're trying to get the pigeon that did somebody before you hit. And so they want to feed on the carrion. And the image here is, man, this is the way we were like. But the king is casting an entirely different vision here. The question is, do the living really want to feed on that which is alive? Do you really hunger and thirst for righteousness? There's a, because if you do, the king says, you'll be filled. Do you really want your life to reflect the righteousness of God? That's the question on the table. All of us immediately say yes but after the, the quick yes vote, let's dig. And look at your name and say, let's dig a little deeper. Because we know when we're in church, we got to say yes. But let's go a little further than that. Because if we, re- listen, how many of y'all have ever been really hungry? We say stuff like, I'm starving. Very few people in this room were, have ever actually been starving. Okay, very few. Maybe a couple of y'all. Very few people have actually been starving. How many of y'all have ever been really, really thirsty? I mean, like, I mean, just how did you act when you were really hungry or really thirsty? If you're really thirsty, does it have to be Dasani? Or will the water out the hose with the spider that just ran out the hose? You ever ever remember, remember, remember back in the day when kids used to play outside? Remember back in those days where, and you, not only did you, I mean, you didn't have like a playroom in your house like we have now with, you know, a couple of screens and Xboxes and then the, the jungle gym in the house. Remember when we had to go outside? And remember, some of y'all, I grew up in South Carolina, and I remember it would be like 120. <laughs> and, we were, and we were outside all day, and, and, and they didn't, because you were hot and kind of sweaty and smelly and sticky, don't come in here. Right. So you couldn't even come in. So what did you do? I've drunk. I've had many a a thirst quenching drink out of a water hose in my lifetime. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you come on in the water warm. It didn't matter. You were thirsty, man. (laughs) Or you were really, really hungry. It didn't matter what cookies, chips, leftovers, sandwich, some of your sandwich. How many of y'all have ever taken a bite after somebody off of something? Where now you would, I would, you, but then you were like, I'll, I, yes, I'll take it, please. <laughs> you outside dirty, they outside dirty, their hand goes in the Dorito bag with the dirt, your hand goes what? In right. <laughs> Jesus pronounces this blessing on people who want righteousness the way you wanted some of them dirty Doritos. 
I'm trying to make it plain for you. He, he pronounces this blessing. He said there would be this feeling that would come for those who are so thirsty that they're willing to do what it takes to get the thirst quenched. I submit to you, well, maybe I'll, 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 be, I'll play it safe this morning. I'll just confess to you that I rarely view righteousness like that. As much as I have read his word, when I go past the quick yes vote and go past, you know, what I know I'm supposed to say, down in my heart, do I really get up in the morning and hunger for righteousness this day? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm feeling awfully suspect underneath this word this morning. So maybe you're better than me, but I'll, I'll, I need to learn from this today. Recall that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The word righteousness, this thing that we're supposed to hunger and thirst for, that the Lord says, this is what I want in my kingdom. People who hunger and thirst for righteousness has a definition. And the word here means an equity in character by implication, an innocence, a holiness. You remember Paul told the church in Corinth that be children in malice or be infants in evil. That's a righteous way to be where, where you're not mature in doing wrong, you're infants in doing wrong. You don't quite know what you're doing, nor do you want to know what you're doing. Righteousness is like that. Webster defines righteousness as a purity in heart and rectitude of life, conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness as used in scripture and theology in which it is chiefly used is nearly equivalent to holiness, but there's a couple of shades of difference. It comprehends holy principles, but it also comprehends the affections of the heart. It is the conformity of life to the divine law. And the thing about righteousness that separates it slightly from holiness is this next sentence. It includes all we call justice, honesty, virtue, with holy affections. In short, it is true religion. My definition, righteousness denotes not just purity, but a rightness, or if you're following along with the fill-in, or correctness. It implies justice, that which is good, that which is fair, that which is upright, that which is unprejudiced. It means thoughts, words, and actions that align with the truth. In other words, to be righteous is to be right, as God defines right. And so the holy person who is, you know, stays in his room and thinks thoughts of holiness and shuts out the world and worldliness and carnality is operating in holiness and we absolutely need to do that. The righteous person will take that same heart and that same holiness and go step out of his, his or her door and apply that to what's going on around them. So maybe we could define it like this. Righteousness can be said to be applied holiness. The Lord says that he wants us to hunger and thirst after thoughts and words and actions that align with the truth. He wants us to hunger and thirst for that which is good, that which is fair, that which is upright, that which is unprejudiced. It is taking that which is holy in you the understanding of the word and the actions that flow from that, and then applying it for the glory of God and the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Righteousness implies action. You can be holy on the mountain. You need to come off the mountain and take your holiness and go be righteous. And work for righteousness all around you. Righteousness, like every beatitude that we'll cover, is a part of the character of God. A few verses here, gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The, the, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. 
Psalm 119, 142. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are what? All thy commandments are righteous. They're not just holy, but they are to be obeyed and applied. They are righteous. They produce righteousness in us. If we listen, Psalms 119 and 172. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Righteousness and judgment are often put together because judgment is God's applications of, of his law to situations. Since the reason why judgment and righteousness kind of go together. Okay, right. His righteous judgment, his right and correct judgment coming to bear on a situation that is unrighteous. Clouds and darkness are round about him, as we said. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. This is who God is. He's holy. He's also righteous. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways. When he acts, there's nothing wrong with it. All of his acts are right. Jesus said, I want you to hunger and thirst for your actions to be right. Not just the intentions of your heart, but when they come out, I want your actions to be in alignment with righteousness. Do you really desire that? You really hunger and thirst for that? and holy in all his works. I heard the angel of the waters say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be because thou hast judged us. There it is again, righteousness connected with judgment. How many of you would like to make more righteous judgments about things? You know, what's a, maybe what's a better way to, to say that? You have a more biblical worldview Right. Where you look at situations or you look at something and the things that, that you think process and come out of your mouth, they don't come out in carnality. They don't come out fleshly. They don't come out based on experiences per se, but they come out based upon the word of God. And then so then righteousness gets spoken forth into the land and actions prayerfully follow. How many, of you know, right now, based on all the chaos around us, we need a righteous church. We need to be little, as a deacon was praying this morning, he said, Lord, help us to be that light. You know, we need to be little beacons of, of righteousness every place that we go. People, wouldn't it be awesome if people looked at your family and saw righteousness? Not, no, no, nowhere in here do we hear the word arrogance. So we're not talking about some kind of high-mindedness that, that puts people off. No, no, we're just saying, wow, the judgment that you made, the, 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 the decisions that you made that, that come out there, they're righteous. How your family's operating smacks of that which is right, good, pure. You didn't just keep it up here in the mental Rolodex, but it dropped down those, those long 18 inches, and now you're walking this out. Do you hunger for that? Truth be told, y'all, I'll just pause here to say, did I just say y'all? Okay, I did. But truth be told, friends, Sometimes it's the opposite of that. Sometimes even we who love the Lord, who go to church and faithful and all that, we struggle with this whole issue of hunger. It's almost like we're doing God a favor when we have to do what he says. Or we're on the other side and we feel like, we feel, we, we feel like it don't take all that. That's a long way from hungering and thirsting after righteousness. When we're trying to get by with the bare minimum and God is saying, no, hunger for me, thirst for my ways. That is, not, that is there's no bare minimum in that. Okay, okay, I'm sensing, I'm sensing that one bouncing off a few brains there. Okay, let me, a few hearts, let me back up. Uh, all the married folk in the room say amen. amen. Okay. I believe my wife, I've been married 25 years, I believe my wife loves it when I hunger and thirst for her. I want to be with her. I adore her. I want to be in the same room as her. I, I long to see her and tell her she's beautiful. And I don't think 
correct me if I'm wrong, she's over there in the corner, but I don't think she wants me to be half-hearted with my marital hunger and thirst. I mean, we married, what? And I know the opposite is certainly true. When she looks at me a certain way, and be like, boy, look at you. Man, I could take on the world in that moment right there. It's just, we understand this. We know this in personal relationships. I want my children to hunger and thirst for the commands of our household. I don't want them to do the bare minimum to not catch a beat down. We all get this. We all know this. God is saying, can you be that way towards me? Don't look at what's the minimum. Look at, Lord, how do I take this all the way out to be everything that you wanted me to be? That's hunger. That's thirst. And Jesus says, hey, you roll, that's what you want. I honor that so much. Look, you're going to get that. You hungry and thirst for righteousness. Look, as hard as you hungered and thirsted for that whopper or hard as you thirsted for that, that, that Mountain Dew or whatever it was, or back when you used to drink and you remember how you couldn't just, can't wait to get you a taste and all. Okay. Okay. So you are, you understand what I'm talking about. You act that way towards me. If that's flowing out of your heart for me, I'm going to bless that. Oh, yeah, I'm filling that up. That's, this is a great promise. If you're hungry, if you hunger and thirst after God and his ways, you shall be filled. No questions, no qualifiers is coming. I love that. I love that. So, again, how many of us truly hunger and thirst for righteousness? That's the question that, that stuck with me, and that's why I'm putting it on you. Maybe you can think it through. To hunger here, again, means to crave. It means to be famished. If you look at uh, the word in the original language, didn't give you a bunch of Greek today. The thirst has a similar connotation. The image is to be severely parched. It is to crave that which sustains. It is, the image is, if I don't eat, I will die. If I don't get something to drink, I will perish. That's what's going on here. This isn't, I'm not really hungry, but I'll have a snack. That's not what's going on here. Okay, this is to crave. Say that word with me, crave. This is, to, this is to long for. I love Spurgeon here. They hunger and they thirst. The most urgent needs of the body are used to see forth the cravings of the soul for righteousness. Hunger and thirst are different, but they are both the language, two words here, of keen desire. He that has ever felt either of these two knows how sharp are the pangs they bring. And if the two are combined in one craving, listen, they make up a restless, terrible, unconquerable passion. Do you feel that way about righteousness? Restless, terrible, unconquerable passion. I just want to be that man, that woman that God wants me to be in holiness and maturity and righteousness. And oh, by the way, just real quick, this one's for free. If you don't pray, don't want to pray, nobody can make you pray. Don't read your Bible, don't want to be, read your Bible, can't nobody make you read your Bible. Don't serve, don't want to serve, can't nobody make you serve, and don't you dare try. You know, just look at your neighbor and say, it ain't looking good. I mean, in other words, you can, you can add a few more in there. You, can, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to wait till two years from now to figure this out. You can do a self-check now to see whether or not there's true hunger and true thirst burning in you for the things of God. And if you're like me, you're looking at yourself going, mm, C minus. Some days, D plus. Some days in the B range, but it don't last. I'm not doing the things that will keep that fire burning. Focus too much on all the foolishness and not enough on the Savior. And how many of that will take it out to you every time? Listen, you can't even expect to hunger and thirst for righteousness if you don't pray. And if there's nothing in you. Now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm up here hammering away saying, pray, you need to pray. I'm going to call you tomorrow to see if you prayed. That ain't what we're talking about. 
I'm talking about it's flowing out of you. There's a blessing here. Restless, terrible, unconquerable passion. Who shall resist a man hungering and thirsting? Listen, his whole being fights to satisfy his awful needs. Blessed are they that have a longing for righteousness, which no one word can fully describe and no one craving can set forth. Hunger must be joined with thirst to set forth the strength and eagerness of the desire after righteousness. You put the two together and you have somebody that will not stop. Not only are they hungry, they're also thirsty. The Psalms give us wonderful examples. As the heart panteth after the brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul, what? Thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Psalm 63, O God, thou art my God. How early, right, or when early will I seek thee? My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh, what? Longeth. I mean, does, does, is this registering with anyone's current experience? Maybe you've had this at some point in life. What happened? What's stopping this? What in the world has intruded? What has broke this up in you? There may have been a moment where you hungered and thirsted, where you jumped out of your bed in the morning and hit your knees. And said, oh, God, I need thee. What happened? Where'd that go? What in life stopped that? A good thing or a bad thing? If it's good, how do we reorient it? If it's bad, how do we cast our care from the Lord because he cares for us and get back to our first love? Psalms 84, my soul longeth. When was the last time your soul longed for righteousness? Your soul, the inner man, your thoughts, your heart, your actions, everything in you say, oh Lord, I just want some chicken right now. No, that's not what we're talking about. Oh God, he's preaching too long, I just wanted to be over. No, that's not what we're talking about right now. No, your soul is going, Lord, I long for thy courts. I long for thy presence. I long for righteousness. God, I want my thoughts to reflect what I know to be true. I want to think like you and talk like you and feel what you feel. Oh, God, I know I'm a wretch and done change my heart. You know, there's passion involved. It's not this kind of blasé kind of I'm taking it in cool. No, sometimes you have to put cool aside. And if you can't, or that's difficult, what is it? What needs to happen? What do you need to do to get before your king and recapture your awe, your zeal, your hunger? great word, your thirst for righteousness. Psalms 143, I stretch forth my hands unto thee, my soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. I'm going to be bold. Y'all heard my confession. I'm going to be bold and say that very few of us live like this on a consistent basis. Now, that may not be you, but you can tell by the way that we live, by the casual nature wherein we, we receive the word or take the things of God, how we treat the church, how we tr our heart for lost souls, how passionate we can get about stuff that's not eternal, and how dispassionate we can be about the stuff that is eternal how we are up in arms over Zeke being suspended six games. One, either you're for it or against it. That's not our thing, okay? Right? But then we're going, and God is saying, be hungry for right there. righteousness, righteousness. You know, righteousness, is, you know, that means I got to stop doing this, stop doing that. I got to change my life and stuff. You know, it don't take all that. I'm saved. What you want, preacher man? Hey, it ain't about me. I'm, I'm sitting up here preaching today on, on a D plus. So it ain't even like that. You know, I'm going, in my own estimation, I'm going, I got so much work to do with this. But most of what, what would happen if we, if we caught fire again and stayed lit for a while? 
I read this recently on hungering and thirsting for rights. Y'all okay? All right. Now, this is a very strong expression. It's no uncommon thing to say, oh, I'm so hungry. I'm so thirsty. How few of us know what the words really mean. This comparison of hungering and thirsting is a very severe touchstone or test of character. Now, suppose that we try to take to pieces this great idea of righteousness. What does it mean? The ordinary details of daily life towards others, for example, it means, or in those ordinary details, it means briefly truthfulness and sincerity in speech and conduct, even-handed justice, unbiased by any thought of our own self-interest, kindness, not only as a superfluous overflow of goodness, but as a part of justice. There that thing is again with righteousness, the application of holiness, the application of knowledge. Okay. Love is the, or because God has made it our duty to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Love is the fulfilling of the law. It includes spotless honor, considerate thoughtfulness, courtesy, gentleness. Indeed, it is the mind of Christ. What does it mean toward God? It means supreme heartfelt love. Listen, unswerving, prompt obedience. <laughs> Isn't that hard? Is that, is that hard for anyone else? Prompt obedience? Uh, it must be real hard because no one raised their hands either. Either y'all are really holy or that's really hard. Which one is it? You know, I was saying this on Thursday night. There's this Bible study on Thursday. Oh, by the way, can I, can I throw a joke in? Yeah, I really do mean it kind of as a joke, but kind of serious. Don't nobody ask me for a Bible study no more. Hey, Bible study, Bible study, Bible study. You don't come. Come on now. It's here. I love you. Okay, anyway, back to the message. Okay, so, so there's this, I said this on Thursday. There's this tension between the, the reality that all of us are sanctified at different rates. Say Amen but that God requires instant obedience. And there's a tension there. We're all sanctified at different rates. Say amen. amen. God requires instant obedience. Say amen. amen. I mean, I ain't reading. He's going, you know, here's my command. Now, if you feel like it, when you catch revelation knowledge. So we so there is that tension that most of us attribute to grace. We are grateful for the grace of God in the midst of, of, of that. Well, this is kind of this is kind of like that. Those who are who, who are hungering and thirsting for, for for righteousness, their promptness goes up. There's less fooling around with it because of the hunger and thirst. It would be like if I'm on a seven day fast and someone puts a peanut butter and jelly sandwich right here. I'm not going hmm, peanut butter and jelly. This looks pretty good there. It looks like a good amount of peanut butter. What kind of jelly is that? Great. Oh, strawberry jelly. Okay, looks good. What kind of bread is that? One? Okay, this is nature's own. Honey wheat? Oh, praise God. <laughs> looks good. How much does it weigh? What kind of, where'd you get the plate? Was this in your budget? No, no, we're not doing any of that. You're hungry, fast is over. You're going, peanut butter jelly! I mean, it's just... Because how many know you're really hungry? Even manners take a back seat. <laughs> manners will come back after the first plate. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, you'll get, it will come back. What your mama taught you will come back. But the first plate, we're going in. Prompt obedience, absolute trust, unquestioning, invariable preference of his will. There's no debate when you're hungering and thirsting whether or not you want his will or not. You just do. His service, his glory to any desire or apparent interest of my own. And this does not exhaust the list, but taking it so far, no one can say that there is anything superfluous, anything exaggerated in any of these details. Can we honestly say that is myself as I would be, as I would feign to be, as I strive to be and pray to be? That is myself as I ought to be. I long, nay, I hunger and thirst to be righteous as he is righteous. I'm, I'm giving myself a just bordering on a failing grade. Where y'all? I find myself answering no to the above question. How short I've fallen in truly craving righteousness and holiness. 
You see, when one is truly hungry and thirsty, one can, here's some feelings for you, one cannot stop thinking about food and drink. It's like when we're fasting as a congregation and every commercial on is about food. And then even when that's not on, you're still thinking about food and fantasizing about what you're going to eat when we break the fast. Come on, say amen if you can. I'm not the only one that has run the farm fresh quickly after the end of a fast or whatever. When one is truly hungry and thirsty, you can't stop thinking about it. Look, how often is being righteous in your thoughts like that where you can't get it out of there? How I many you know it's normally the opposite? We're normally battling with lusts and other stuff, and that's the stuff that's run. But we're not, we're, it's not, no, not typically. When one is truly hungry and thirsty, one does not worry about appearances. You ain't even trying to be cute with it. You hungry. You ever take a good swig of water when you just, maybe you went to Bush Gardens and you didn't get no water until like 1 p.m. and someone gives you a big old thing of Dasani and it's just, half the water is pouring down the side and you think it's hot anyway, you get on the shirt, I feel it's cool off. You know, you just, it, you've lost all, all couth. You are totally uncouth. You know, I, I deal with this at home because my children are always telling me how hungry they are. They starving all the time. You know, you, you, I mean, they get, they get three hots in a cot plus snacks in between the three hots, right? But they're always starving. I'm so, yesterday it was like a hunger fest. I'm so hungry, daddy. You just ate dinner, but I'm hungry. You want a banana? I don't want no banana. Okay. Do you want some grapes? I don't want no grapes. I want crackers. <laughs> and my wife's going, children ain't hungry. Or my son is famous for this one, where he will sit, bless his heart, he young now, so I can talk about him in the sermon. So bless his heart, my, my son has very, very powerful facial expressions. He's, I mean, he, he, that little face, man, he can make some faces. And he'll sit down there at dinner time or lunchtime sometimes, and if mama did not make him what he wanted, I mean, it's bad. And I'm looking at him like, boy. And, I, and, and y'all, y'all would think I'm the meanest dad in the world, but I have gotten to doing this. I've learned from my wife. When them children ain't hungry, they, that's, they spoil now. They get everything they want. And if she's sitting there, y'all, some of y'all wives know how you're under your breath when you're trailing off and getting everything you want. And you keep giving them all this stuff. And uh, that's the reason why he acting like that. If you just go. <laughs> okay, so I'm sitting over there. Okay, I'm listening. Though. I'm learning. I'm listening. I'm learning. Okay. So I have, I have, I have taken to saying, boy, get up from my table. Take you and your face to your room. You ain't hungry. You will miss this meal, and maybe you will have more gratefulness the next meal. Mm -hmm. You and your face. I'm going up to the room. Oh, ungrateful turkey. <laughs> but aren't we just like, I mean, when you're hungry, Truly hungry, it don't matter what you put down in front of you, you're gonna eat. It could be stuff, it could be food you don't really even like. Mm, this is good. <laughs> Man, where'd you make this? Look, I know, I don't know if y'all, some of y'all grew up in the country like I did, but I, I, I was kind of like my son, so the Bible says you reap what you sow. I was kind of that picky kid because I was a little spoiled. And, uh, and so I'm getting it back now with my son. But uh, I didn't like, you know, all, the, all some of the southern kind of country delicacies like chitlins and stuff. I, I, I couldn't eat them. You know why I couldn't eat chitlins? They stank. People thought they was like the best thing since sliced bread. And I would walk in the house and my mother looked like she cleaned the sheet in the sink. I said, what you doing, mama? She said, I'm cleaning chitlins. I said, what is that smell? I found out later what a chitterling is. Pig intestine. No wonder they stink. Pig digestive tract. 
Some of y'all say, uh huh, and it sure is good. <laughs> Some of y'all so country, man. Some of y'all are so, mm-hmm, you right now, I'm gonna find, go down to Joe's, uh, what's the saying, and get some shillings a day. You done got it all in my spirit, Bishop. <laughs> and I would see people put them on rice and what on the top? Y'all country. But I couldn't eat them. I could not, I refuse. But if I'm truly hungry, and that's all that's on the table. <laughs> Y'all are funny. <laughs> Listen, when one is truly hungry and thirsty, one's pride becomes secondary. It's not about you anymore. It's not about how you look. It's not about how you perceive. It's not about your status. It's not about your degree. It's not about... You know, you're, how you need now all, when you starving for God, starving for the things of God, that stuff becomes less and less and less, and that's a good thing. When one is truly hungry and thirsty, one's not picky about the food and the drink. It's not picky. Lord, I just, give me the scraps falling off your table. What, long as I get you. When one is truly hungry and thirsty, one becomes willing. And oh, by the way, this will change the church too. Because half the stuff now we're not willing to do in terms of like serving or whatever because the has, thing hasn't quite got to the way we want it. I mean, all that would go away. You know, it's too early, it's too late. It's on the wrong day. You know, I don't like the one who running it. They don't sing my song right. All that stuff would totally vanish. It's gone, it's done. We're too hungry and thirsty. They'd be picking over the food like that. When one is truly hungry and thirsty, one becomes willing to do whatever it takes to satiate the appetite and the thirst. I put some scriptures here that says that the righteousness is the call of every believer. I I submit those to you, commend those to you to read in the interest of time because I want to give you these blanks. I dare not dismiss without making sure that the blanks have been given. (laughs) must not be done. So the Lord <laughs> pronounces a blessing on those who hunger thirst for righteousness and the blessing is they shall be filled. Our Lord declares that those who desperately desire righteousness <clears throat> are blessed and their desire will be filled. So what is the blessing? Now let me say that there's certainly an eschaton in time blessing being this kind of inferred here, uh, a blessing that will come when we're in heaven, enraptured by nothing but righteousness because literally we're surrounded by him. And, uh, and all the saints, and so there's that. But is there a right now kind of blessing? Well, in doing some research for this, obviously I was very impacted by a sermon that Charles Spurgeon gave in the, in the late 1800s, and he gave these points, and I just said, you know what, uh, Brother Spurgeon, I'm gonna give my, my church these points because I just was really impacted by them. I thought they were excellent. And so I'm gonna give you these. Spurgeon gave seven reasons for the blessing, seven ways we, in which we are blessed when we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the first is this. Spurgeon says, why are they blessed? Well, first, because Jesus says they are. And if he says it, we do not need any further proof. I love that. Because what it does, what that first one, I need to do this more often myself. What it does is it removes our kind of Western, you've got to show it's worth my wild spirit. I'll do this only if you show me some benefit from it. Thing that we have going in our current culture. That's not what Spurgeon, so he just, he just obliterates that right off the top. It says, first of all, you receive it by faith. Because the Lord says you're going to be blessed, you're going to be blessed. Period, end, and that's enough. Then he goes on, he gives more. But I love that. I need, how many know we need more of that in our spirit? When the master speaks, that's good enough. He's enough. It's like, it's like we as parents, if I, I don't, okay, yes, I could give you an explanation as to why I want you to vacuum your room. And I could describe cleanliness and godliness and order in the home and learning character of doing a chore and all those things, but I don't always want to do all that. Do just do what I said. And then double bless me and do it with the right attitude. Daddy, I don't even know why you said it. The fact that you said it is good enough for me. We all want that. It's amazing. We all want that in our relationships with our children, as an example. Um, 
And to some degree, in all of our relationships, we want people who just love us just and, and, and just because they love us. But, you know, I think God wants the same. So, so that's the first one. <clears throat> Spurgeon says, I didn't put this in your notes, though, but he says it on that point. He says, if looking around on the crowd, our Lord passes by those who are self-satisfied and his eye light on the men that sigh and cry and hunger and thirst after righteousness. And if with smiling face, he says, these are the blessed ones, then depend on it that they are so. He says, I would rather be one whom Christ counted blessed than one who was so esteemed by all the world. For the Lord Jesus knows better than men do. Amen. Amen. Man. Number two, the man hungering after righteousness ought to consider himself a happy man because he has been made to know the right value of things. Value of things. Before he set a high value upon worthless pleasure, he reckoned the dross of the praise of men to be as pure gold, but now, he values righteousness and is not as the child who prizes glass beads more than pearls. Love that. He has already obtained some measure of righteousness for his judgment reckons rightly. And he ought to be thankful to be so enlightened. Once he put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, darkness for light and light for darkness. But now the Lord has brought him to know what is good. And what it is that the Lord doth require of him. So there's a blessing that comes because you've been changed by the Lord. The, the fact that you value righteousness at all is proof that God himself is working in your heart. That's a blessing. Here's another one. Number three. Observe further <clears throat> that not only does he estimate things correctly, but he has a heart towards that which is good and desirable. Do y'all remember a time in your Christian walk where TV shows, music, habits, certain things that you once were really, really attracted to begin to, lost the, began to lose their taste and savor? Did anyone have that experience at all? I'm not, not to say that you do it perfectly now. I mean, you still may have a longing or a craving or whatever. But, but, you know, just, you know, the way we said it growing up is I'm not all I should be, but thank God I'm not all that I. Anybody, anybody have that? OK, that's God, right, doing that. And so Spurgeon says here, there's a blessing that comes when your heart has turned towards that which is good and desirable, that which you didn't always have. He says, once we only cared for the earthly comforts, but now this person hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Give me a bit of meat in the pot, cries the worldling, and I'll leave your precious righteousness to those who want it. But this man that we're talking about prizes the spiritual above the natural. Righteousness is happiness to him. God has filled him with a desire that God himself approves. That's a blessing. Number four. He says he is blessed because in the presence of this hunger, many meaner or greater at one point hungers die out. Your hunger for God begins to override your hunger for other stuff. And that is a true blessing. <laughs> Spurgeon says one master passion like Aaron's rod swallows up the rest. He hungers and thirsts after righteousness and therefore he, has, he is done with the craving of lust, the greed of avarice, the passion of hate, the pining of ambition. He gives an example. He says, we've known sickly men to be overtaken by a disease which was so powerful that it drove out all their other complaints. In other words, sometimes even sickness can teach you the blessing. I thought I had it bad until now. Now I understand just how good I had it. So some of the other hungers begin to die away as the greater hunger of the Lord begins to smash on them and clash on them. And you find yourself now a different person in the Lord Jesus because of this blessing. Number five. These men are blessed by being delivered from many foolish delusions. I love that. These men are blessed, and women too, 
by being delivered from many foolish delusions. The delusion most common, I got to read this one. The, 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 the delusion most common is that man can get everything that he needs in religion out of himself. I got to read this one. Listen, listen very carefully because there's a lot of this in the church. Most men are deluded in this way. They think that they have a springing well of power within from which they can cleanse and revive and satisfy themselves. But try a hungry man or a thirsty man with this doctrine. My dear fellow, you need not be hungry. You can satisfy yourself from within. What is his answer? I have tied a hunger belt around myself to keep down the hunger, but even that I did not find within myself. I am hungry and must have food from the outside or I shall die. The delusion that it's all in you. The humanist, pagan idea that has infiltrated the church. Just believe in yourself. When you wish upon a star. I mean, we got a lot of Disney theology in the church. Believe in yourself. You know, you just got to believe. See, what you really need, oh, thank you, Jesus. What you really need is you need to go down on the inside and find the spark. So let your neighbor say foolishness two times. Crazy, crazy, way out of the pale of Christian orthodoxy to think like that. I love Spurgeon here. He says, self-trust is a refuge of lies. I must be helped from above. I must be saved by grace or I shall remain unrighteous to the end. Spiritual hunger and thirst are wonderful teachers of the doctrine of grace and every good, and very good rather, and very good at dispelling pride. So spiritual hunger makes you realize I can't reach into my own mouth and pull out a sandwich. Somebody has to give it to me. I don't have an internal Dasani supply. It has to come from the outside. Oh, this is good. I just thought of something I could use as a husband. Baby, if you don't cook, I won't eat. I'll try it. It may not work, but you know I'll try it. Okay. Man, but we're deluded into thinking that it's all within. Just trust yourself and go with your gut. My gut has gotten me in a lot of trouble. You mean this thing that's unruly and needs to be fasted occasionally? That gut? No, no, no. I need wisdom from above. Because, and the Lord's already taught this, right? The poor in spirit, those who mourn those who are meek. It's all there. All right. Number six, once again, these men are blessed because they are already worked upon by the Holy Ghost. Hunger and thirst after righteousness worked upon by the Holy Ghost. Hunger and thirst after righteousness are always the, the production of the Holy Spirit. You can hear this today and miss the God component that you got to go home and willpower your way into this and totally miss it. You got to get before God and go, Lord, my hunger is not where it needs to be. I need you. I need to show me I need you to show me who I am before you and help me. We need you. And then finally, this man is blessed for in his hunger and thirst. He is in accord with the Lord Jesus Christ. When our Lord was here, says Spurgeon, he hungered after righteousness, longing and suffering for his father's will. At one point, even saying, I have meat to eat that ye not know of. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus was not talking about literal food there. He was saying, my, literally, my sustenance is to do that which the Father has commanded me to do. Oh, for a heart like that. So as we close today, my prayer is that we would grow in our spiritual hunger after our Lord. Listen, friends. There will always be something to distract you. If you're looking for a reason not to pray, you'll find it. Not to study, not to be a disciple maker, not to open up your home for hospitality, not to serve. 
I mean, it's always going to be there. But blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I hope I can count you among those who hear a word like this and say, you know, I want my hunger and thirst for God to increase. I'm going to get on my face before a holy God and say, Lord, I've graded myself. It's not looking the way I, you want it to look. Forgive me. Show me. Help me hunger and thirst for you. I don't want to be trite. I don't want it to be cliche. I don't want to run from one Christian cultural hip thing to another. Lord, I want you. I want you. That's my prayer, that we would feel like that after a message like this today, where we would look at even, you'll, 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 you'll sense it this afternoon, because when we say amen, you'll go home, and you'll have, I mean, it's not, it's not even noon. You'll go home, and you have eight or nine hours before bedtime when we say amen. Eight or nine hours, most, some of y'all 10 hours before bedtime. With no, no services coming back this way, right? So 10 hours. Can you give God some of that 10 today on his day? And if, if, that, if that feels burdensome, why? Why? Why does that feel burdensome? What is that in us where God gets the leftovers? Help us, Lord. There's a lost, as has been said several times this morning, there's a lost world, there's a dying world. There's a, listen, today, some good things have happened. We've heard this, I think, reasonably in context. We've prayed for our enemies. There's a world out there. That you'll get home today, turn the news on, and it'll be, and it can just consume you this afternoon. But Jesus is still the answer. And you and I have the privilege to show a world what it looks like to be one who hungers and thirsts after the master. This is no small thing. It's a great responsibility and a great privilege. And I pray we would do it together. I love you all so much. I'm so grateful for these 20 years that I've had with you. I'm so excited about what God can do with this church. Yes, Lord, thy will be done in all things. Let's hunger for him. Let's thirst for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me?